Let's invite uh, Dr. Eider Bergenza from the Kalsur Institute of Technology. As she graduates in physics in 2012 from University of Basco Country. In June 2018, she obtained PhD degree with the highest mark from the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid. In 2019, she was awarded with the Humboldt Fellowship and joined Nanotechnology Institute, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Germany, where she started a new topic in deep pen nanolithography and fluid force microscopy. Then in 2021, she got the Young Investor Group preparation program. And in 2022, she joined the group of nanomagnetism in ICMM within the frame of Juan de la Incorporation postdoctoral fellowship. She has a co-author of uh, more than 20 scientific papers, one book chapter in a reputed journals like ICS Nano, ICS Applied Materials. So her presentations is today, presentation's title is Scanning Probe Lithography for Bottom-Up Build Biomimic Nanostructure. So the stage is here. You can share your screen and start. Um, let me see. Can I? Uh, presentation mode, share. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah, great. Uh, right. Yeah, cool. Then let's get started. Uh, thank you for the kind presentation. And um, so my name is Seider Berganza. And um, so as, as uh, it was already pointed out, I'm working in Madrid uh, for the CSIC. Um, but the work that I will be showing today uh, was carried out at the Casual Institute of Technology uh, in, in Germany. Um, and I'd like to uh, start by uh, speaking about scanning proof lithography because um, in most of the AFM conferences, uh, naturally, uh, AFM is conceived as a characterization tool. And for example, in the last talk, we could also see how the, the tip can be used um, for, for nanofabrication or for inducing some uh, sample creation. Uh, however, uh, in general, scanning probe lithography uh, has less visibility than AFM as a characterization tool. So um, I got this chat from a nice review from Professor Ricardo Garcia. And uh, there he uh, describes very well how uh, different physical and chemical mechanisms can be used to fabricate samples at the, at the nanoscale. And just to uh, break the ice a little bit, I, I bring a few uh, examples that, so that you can see what we're talking about. Uh, in this example, uh, the, some gold nanowires were mechanically pushed with AFM tips and an nanowire circuit was, uh, was created. Um, one could, for example, um, uh, put a resistive heater in an AFM tip, and then uh, you see how uh, in, in Caltech they were able to pattern uh, the face of Richard and Feynman on a heat sensitive polymer with a nanoscale resolution. Um, this is an example of oxidation, local oxidation triggered by the uh, AFM tip, also from the group of Ricardo Garcia in Spain. And um, this is deep pen nanolithography. So uh, here the AFM tip is used as a quill pen um, to, to uh, get some ink and then transfer it to a substrate with uh, a lot of spatial resolution. This is indeed what I have been uh, working on in the past uh, three years. And we do a special kind of uh, DPN, it's a lipid DPN. Just let me now go to basic um, biology. So uh, this is a eukaryotic cell. And uh, just as a reminder, around the eukaryotic cell, you have a protective uh, semi-permeable uh, barrier, which is called a uh, lipid bilayer. And uh, the lipid bilayer is constituted by some uh, tiny uh, molecules. 
which have this hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tail. So uh, they are amphiphilic. And this is very interesting because it allows them to self-assemble into uh, different shapes. Um, so in general, lipids are uh, often taken as uh, building blocks to build uh, cell models. And there are different types of uh, cell models, in vitro cell models or uh, biomimetic uh, membranes, which is the same thing. Uh, but in our case, we work with supported lipid bilayers. It means that we have bilayers on solid substrates. One of the advantages of this model is that you can then measure it with AFM. Um, but how do we create this uh, supported lipid bilayers? easiest is to take a substrate and incubate it with uh, vesicles. Uh, however, of course, there you don't have spatial resolution. So if we want to do some patterning with spatial resolution, you might consider to do deep pen nanolithography. So you see the AFM uh, tip is coated with lipids and the lipids are transferring through the water meniscus to the substrate uh, when there is uh, contact, right? And then by moving the tip, you can pattern arbitrary shapes. Um, why is this interesting? So let me show you just a few examples uh, related to biomedicine. Uh, this first uh, paper, for example, that I show here, uh, it's from, from the group where I'm working, from the group of Michel Hirtz, uh, and they were able to capture some exosomes onto this supported lipid bilayers um, and, and, and trap uh, some, uh, let's say, the information on um, exosomes from early cancer uh, patients. Uh, but it is also interesting to, to do some other uh, stuff with, with this supported lipid bilayers. You can functionalize pre-existing structures, uh, to give an example, or you can directly uh, build structures yourself. This is an example where a diffraction rating uh, was built just with the, with the lipid patterning. Okay, so now uh, let's directly go to uh, to my own work. Um, so um, it, two years ago, we started a collaboration with a group of uh, Milos Gallic. They are working in the University of Münster here in Germany, um, and they are studying um, they, they're studying uh, mem uh, lipid membrane curvature, which is relevant to many biological processes that you can think about. In particular, they focus on the study of this bar uh, family of proteins, which are sensitive to changes uh, in the lipid membrane curvature. Uh, the thing is, uh, they know to which kind of curvature these proteins bind. It's a nanoscale uh, curvature. However, uh, they're not so sure about the lipid selectivity, the composition. So um, we took a look at the literature and we saw that uh, 10 years ago, uh, many papers were published on uh, studies on membrane curvature in the micron scale. But um, how to take these uh, studies to the nanoscale, right? Uh, this is tricky from the fabrication point of view. So we thought, okay, let's keep it simple. Let's start with some nanoparticles. Uh, on a substrate and then on top we can pattern lipids and create this membrane curvature so that they can perform their studies. So the idea was to uh, pattern um, particles of different radios and on top pattern lipids of different compositions and then they could screen uh, a little bit. Uh, this uh, was less simple than uh, one could imagine. Uh, so the first issue uh, that we faced was, okay, uh, we have some particles, but when we try to write the lipids on top, we're just dragging them uh, to, to the corners because we're subjecting our particles to very high lateral forces uh, while doing this patterning. So we had to tune a little bit the surface chemistry to uh, try uh, to get to anchor particles to the substrate. And in the second row, you can see here an example of how uh, we could do it. We could pattern this square on top of a, um, a substrate coated with uh, um, nanoparticles. Uh, another issue was to make sure uh, that the particles were really coded, like you see here in the sketch in the, in the uh, top uh, image, uh, and not, you know, sometimes it might happen that the particles were actually sticking out and th that is no way to create memory cur curvature, right? So uh, we found out that actually uh, the phase of oscillation channel was a very good indicator of whether we had particles completely covered, like you see here, or the particles were sticking out and then giving this right contrast. Uh, so uh, mainly 
we had to tune a little bit the writing parameters, uh, go pretty slow and go to higher humidities to make sure that there was enough material or enough lipids going to the particles and really uh, covering them. Another issue or another uh, uh, challenge was to write particles, spot the nanoparticles with uh, a lot of uh, precision. Uh, and the particles we're using, uh, so 25 nanometer and uh, 100 nanometer of diameter, they are fairly big for uh, AFN, for an AFN device. So actually the way to patent them was to use this microchannel cantilever spotting. This is, this is very similar to AFN, but it's just uh, slightly bigger and a little bit more simple. Um, so you can basically just patent some uh, spots. Um, and um, you can see here the outcome of the, the how we patent these particles. And then by actually, um, uh, multi uh, we wanted to multiplex different uh, lipid compositions um, on, on the same substrate. So by using these parallelized tips, we could, we could do it. Um, and uh, last uh, thing about this uh, particular project is uh, our colleagues in Munster, they uh, wanted to test how, whether the, the um, platform itself was working. So uh, they chose this natrine 2 uh, protein, it's also from the bar family, uh, conjugated with uh, yellow fluorescent protein, right? So um, we provide some samples and uh, then they uh, have to do some incubation with the proteins. And then of course, if there is binding, then uh, something, some signal should be detected in the in the uh, under the yellow uh, uh, filter. Um, so what they found out is that uh, upon uh, binding, uh, trying to bind uh, on uh, um, neutral, electrically neutral lipids, there was no binding. Whereas uh, if we add a little, a little bit of uh, negative uh, lipids, like negatively charged lipids, this POPS, uh, there was uh, some binding. There was some shift to to. Uh, yellow fluorescence. Uh, and this is just to show you uh, some negative control. So uh, we did the same experiment uh, with negatively charged lipids on a, a flat surface, and there we also see uh, no binding. So the conclusion is uh, that you need to have uh, a little bit of negative charge in the in the lipid composition, but also some curvature to uh, have this uh, protein binding. Okay, um, I'm switching topic very quickly, it's still uh, DPN, but um, I want to show you what I've been working on. I'm, I've been uh, using lipids beyond biophysics uh, just to do some, uh, to implement some nanolithography process. Uh, so I use lipids as a mask to do some uh, further like uh, sputtering and lift off processes. And I uh, can end up uh, finally after some uh, couple of processes with nickel squares. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the detail because the time is limited, but uh, how can I do this? Uh, so regularly when you pattern some lipids on a substrate, you cannot use this as a mask because the uh, lipid patches that you have as an outcome are way too thin uh, and for masking you need something uh, like a bit thicker. Um, so uh, what we did was uh, to uh, mod modify the substrates before uh, doing the, the patterning with BSA. So for the people working in biophysics, maybe this is quite uh, well known. So it's a, it's a very stable protein and it's very much used uh, in antibody binding experiments. Uh, the interesting thing about this protein is that it has seven pockets uh, that uh, bind to fatty acids like phospholipids. And therefore, um, well, here I show you um, how the um, surface looks like after incubating silicon with BSA. You see these tiny, tiny spheres. Um, the roughness induced there is like uh, below two nanometers. And yeah, the, the, the behavior uh, that you obtain is uh, mild hydrophilic, let's say, you know, from the water contact angle. But the interesting thing is what happens when you do pattern lipids on top of BSA coated um, uh, silicon or any other su uh, surface, let's say. So uh, here I was patterning some lines with increasing speed, you know, so from left to right. On bare silicon, uh, you see that uh, the, the faster you go, the less material uh, you, you have, right? And therefore, uh, you can tune the width of the lines a little bit. 
However, if you do this on uh, BSA coated silicon, uh, you can see that the profiles are very different from uh, those of the non bare silicon, right? And you have actually control over the thickness uh, parameters. So what you're actually doing is you're writing uh, three dimensional. Um, here I show you on the right a little bit of uh, calibration that I did, uh, switching the uh, relative humidity and switching the, the speed uh, to see what kind of uh, thicknesses and what kind of uh, line widths I could obtain uh, on BSA coated uh, surfaces. And I mean, this is all very interesting, but uh, the, what, what happens with the lipids or what the, the lipids we use, they are liquid at room temperature. That's why we can uh, make them flow uh, so nicely. So uh, when you put this into, um, into a liquid uh, for a typical experiment, they, they're washed away. So um, it wouldn't be so interesting to have this uh, 3D structures if they get washed away, right? So we thought, okay, uh, why don't we just make like a metallization step? Uh, and here I show you like a little bit uh, of a more complex structure, this little elephant that I pattern with lipids. And um, in the left, you have the as prepared um, uh, lipid elephant. And on the right, uh, you have the same elephant after coating uh, it with a uh, 20 nanometer gold layer. And what you can see is that uh, the structure remains uh, more or less the same, of course, during uh, uh, evaporation of the gold, uh, there is a little bit of roughness induced because uh, the, the, the physical, uh, the, the gold vapor is energetic and uh, it goes a little bit through the lipids, but essentially we're uh, making this protective barrier and then we can take the structure and put it into water and it is protected enough. Uh, this was, we could also see uh, in uh, FIB, uh, focus ion beam, um, milling. So we did uh, mill one of these uh, structures and here you can see that uh, the, there is this gold layer which is uh, a little bit rough but it is surrounding the structure and this is why uh, it is so well uh, protected. Another interesting thing was that we could actually implement like an additive manufacturing like uh, process where we would uh, write one layer and then on top of this layer we could write another layer and uh, so it's a, a nice way of doing uh, 3D printing with uh, lipids. Um, I'm checking the time. Uh, so let me jump to the uh, next topic that I want to show you. Uh, I've already mentioned that people use um, uh, for to build in vitro cell models, people use phospholipids as building blocks. Uh, biomimicry, so we're basically mimicking uh, natural systems to, to make our, our um, problems easier to solve. Uh, if one wants to not mimic the cell behavior itself, but just uh, see how the cell interacts with the uh, microenvironment, this is uh, like quite trendy nowadays. Um, the, many groups are building three-dimensional polymeric uh, structures. Um, so, uh, in our group, we have proposed to use the fluid force microscopy towards these two, these two goals. Um, and let me explain briefly what fluid force microscopy is. It's a 10 year old technology. It's basically an AFM setup where the tip is hollow. Uh, it is connected to a micro channel and then one can load ink to this reservoir and uh, by applying some uh, pressure pulses, you can make it flow and upon contact to your substrate, you can uh, also uh, direct write your, your ink. Uh, this is how the uh, fluid, uh, fluid force microscopy proofs uh, probes look like. Uh, so you can have this 300 uh, nanometer aperture on, uh, on an AFM probe or uh, directly uh, like a cantilever, a tipless cantilever. So to say with a bigger uh, nozzle uh, there. So this is available from the uh, company who's commercializing Cytosearch. Um, and the question is, why do we want to use uh, fluid FM to write biomimetic membranes, to write uh, lipid membranes? Well, uh, DPN um, has given very nice outcomes throughout the years, like uh, so uh, our group in, in, in Germany has published many papers uh, using this technology, but it has two major limitations. Uh, one of them is that not every ink is uh, writable, so the inks need to meet some specific physical chemical conditions uh, to nicely flow. And uh, the other one is that it is a technique for uh, to work in air environment. Uh, this is just like this. Um, 
if uh, I mean if we use fluid FM, um, so this this is used or oh, this is designed to work uh, in liquid directly. And uh, the other uh, nice advantage is that since the writing mechanism is different because it's based on uh, extrusion, so to say, uh, we can just prepare a water-based uh, solution, uh, put some vesicles on it, and we can write. Uh, very um, like a, we have a wider, much wider choice of uh, phospholipids. Um, so because there was nothing done or nobody so far uh, did this uh, before, uh, we just started patterning in in air. Here you you see some uh, phospholipids which are fluorescently labeled, and uh, if you work in air, you you get fairly big uh, lipid patches. Uh, you see um, the, the thickness of these patches is uh, around 200 nanometers, so it's many bilayer stacks, like just on top of each other. However, if you work directly in water, and that, that was one of the highlights of, of the work we published, um, you, um, you're patterning just single bilayers. Uh, the writing mechanism is very different. We try to explain it here through sketches. Uh, in, if you're writing in air, uh, you're uh, extruding uh, like, a, like a drop. It goes to the substrate, the lipids self-assemble, the water evaporates. And uh, with the um, writing parameters, namely uh, the applied pressure or the, the time you're applying this pressure pulse, uh, you can control the, the, the volume uh, of, the, of, of, of your patch. If you're working in water, then uh, you're uh, pushing some vesicles which fuse on the surface and then a bilayer is forming, so you have some control over the, um, over the area uh, of, the, of, of your patch. And um, so let me just briefly uh, show you how we uh, determine the threshold pressures. Uh, to print different inks in, in air. In air, it is a bit tricky to, to print sometimes because, um, of course, you need, uh, there is this air uh, liquid interface and you need to beat the surface tension of uh, the different inks you're using, right? But remarkably, uh, just to give you an example, we were able to print this DPPC, which is uh, a phospholipid, which is in gel state at room temperature. And uh, with any other techniques, it is not possible to, to print. No? So we did determine the minimum uh, pressure to, to print uh, different inks that were interesting for us. Another interesting thing, uh, when you're printing, uh, now switching to printing in liquid, uh, it is uh, quite relevant in which, uh, in, 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 in which environment, uh, in which media you're printing, because deionized water gave like a very nice, nice outcome, but uh, by printing in phosphate, buffer saline and buffer, uh, the outcome was a little bit less uh, predictable. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, finish by showing you uh, some work uh, with Fluid FM also, where we uh, were trying to print uh, cell scaffolds, polymeric cell, cell scaffolds. Uh, the reason why uh, we want to develop the Fluid FM for this use is because um, there are already very nice uh, um, laser direct uh, laser writing techniques that make very nice uh, three-dimensional scaffolds, but they have a major problem, and it's that um, it is very difficult to make this polymer uh, scaffolds functional because the uh, amount of polymers that one can use uh, or monomers that one can use to then polymerize with a laser is very limited, and uh, they need to meet some requirements, and therefore putting them some functional elements. It's complicated. Uh, what uh, we propose with the Fluid FM is that we can write uh, a UV curable polymer, for example, we can write one layer, then uh, in situ UV uh, cure it, and then write the next layer uh, on top of this. We're working on this in situ curing device uh, right now, uh, but here I show you some other uh, structures uh, that we uh, printed so far. And this year we published a paper where we're showing um, that we can biofunctionalize our um, polymer. So basically we started with the polymer, we can add mix some functional compounds and because we're doing direct writing, we have no limitation to add any 
compounds that give functionality to our structures. In, in this paper, we were using uh, some phospholipids which have modified uh, head groups. Uh, one of them is fluorescent. The other one has a biotin moiety, which uh, makes it interesting because biotin has a lot of uh, affinity for streptavidin. So for binding uh, experiments or for bio experiments, this can be uh, quite interesting. However, um, we did this with these uh, uh, molecules, but one could, of course, uh, add some quantum dots or some uh, nanoparticles to, to this polymer. So there is really no limitation in what one what can do. Uh, but coming back to, to our uh, biofunctionalized uh, polymers, uh, we wanted to make sure uh, with nano indentation experiments that the mechanical properties of, of our polymer uh, were, were not uh, significantly altered by uh, adding these uh, molecules. And um, so this is uh, fairly reasonable. Uh, young modulus values after adding this uh, rhodamine and biotinylated um, um, polymers, let's say, you know, uh, because the amount of molecules we're adding is very small, it's small enough not to significantly change mechanical properties, but at the same time, they have enough, it's enough to give them functionality. And here I show you how uh, we pattern some uh, raw laminated um, uh, polymer, so you can see in the in the red channel. Um, and in the second row, uh, we added some biotinylated uh, polymers, we patterned them, and then uh, upon incubation with streptavidin, which is uh, labeled with uh, green fluorescent protein, you can see uh, some uh, like a green row uh, popping up, meaning that there has uh, the, the binding happened, so that the uh, polymer, the biotinylated polymer, is functional. Um, and uh, last last thing, um, we also try to write this uh, polymer on different um, on, on surfaces with different wet abilities. So you, we modified the chemistry of uh, of, of our glass, and we uh, we we saw that. Um, the the polymer uh, so the, the our features um, are actually uh, have have a different aspect ratio um, um, when when you print them on different uh, surfaces this is this can be interesting because if you print for example on a very hydrophobic surface uh, you can have very large aspect ratio um, dots for example and this helps uh, or this makes you improve the lateral resolution of your printing however if you for some reason need something uh, with uh, lower aspect ratio you can always use a very hydrophilic surface and uh, see them uh, spreading um, so just to uh, wrap it up, this is the end of my talk. Um, and uh, I showed you how we were able to build a platform to screen uh, curvature sensitive proteins. Uh, also, I show you how by tailoring the surface uh, properties, uh, we were able to extend the use of uh, deep pen analytography from 2D to 3D. Uh, and uh, we have proposed the use of uh, fluid force microscopy uh, to write biomimetic membranes with lipids. Uh, we do this in, in water as well, uh, but we've also proposed the use of uh, uh, fluid FM to write cell scaffolds uh, with polymers that can be then functionalized. So this is not the work of a single person. Uh, these are uh, my co-workers co at uh, KID. I'd like to thank uh, all of them and also you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Aida. It's a really nice presentation. Yeah. Okay, so for the question session. So yeah, okay. We are here for two quick questions. So one question is that, uh, will the tip get contaminated easily by the samples or others during the DPN? Uh, what will get contaminated, sorry? The tip. The tip. The probe. Uh, during DPN, I mean, of course, uh, as compared to uh, what uh, Dr. San showed before, no, and really you're uh, uh, visualizing these very, very tiny uh, molecules. Uh, this is something else, right? This is uh, like the ink we're using. It is very dirty, so to say. So it doesn't, for the purpose we're using it, it doesn't matter so much. I mean, you, you cannot think as uh, putting some uh, phospholipids 
um, like uh, single phospholipids. Now it's really like right. a, like a, a very um, uh, dirty ink, so to say. Like uh, the, the the order of magnitude, it's a little bit different, right? So so there right. uh, yeah. everything is playing a role, of course. But as long as it uh, it works, um, <laughs> that is uh, yeah, that is what matters. Yeah. Okay. So move on to the next question. So will the temperature affect the final patches or will it contribute for the different shape of the patches? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Of course, the I mean, we try to control the environmental conditions as much as possible, right? Uh, the temperature in the lab is usually set to like uh, 23 degrees. Uh, and what we control very smoothly is the humidity. So we have the DPN inside like a chamber and both uh, the humidity uh, plays a big role in the outcome of the DPN because uh, it makes the water meniscus bigger. And so if you increase the humidity and the water meniscus is very big, there is a lot of material flow. But uh, the temperature plays um, a similar uh, role, right? Because then the um, also with increasing temperature, there is more um, flow of material. So we try to control it as, as, as much as possible. Okay, so I have a quick question. So yeah. what is the uh, minimum resolution can be achieved using this method? Uh, I mean, it depends on, on what. So for example, uh, like if you this, want to, no, if you want to make a, like a electrical wiring using this uh, ink, like a, if you can, Make a metallic ink. What could be the minimum resolution possible? Um, so, um, if, if you use lipids for this, um, you uh, the resolution is uh, the best would be maybe two hundred nanometers. Because uh, I mean, this this you can try to improve. So, if you really want something uh, very small, then you need to, uh, as I was showing in the examples. Um, tune the surface energy. So you need to find a suitable um, uh, substrate that really makes your ink want to, um, you know, squeeze and not, not spread. Yeah. But generally, if you just work on, on silicon, that would be like a typical thing, silicon or glass, there is, uh, there is spreading. So you really need to control the humidity so that the, the lipids are not spreading so much. And, but yeah, okay. a 200 nanometer would be like a reasonable, uh, lateral resolution in, for our technique. Yeah. Okay, great. So there is no more questions. So thank you once again for your presentations and thanks all the speakers.